memories of the past, visions of the future, the ties that bind, and the conflicts that tear us apart. Ours is a shared experience passed down to us through our history, literature, arts, and philosophy, or in one word, humanities. This is Humanities in the Spotlight. It has been four centuries since William Shakespeare last put down his pen. Four hundred years. To wrap our minds around that, we might imagine a member of our family tree, um, one from each generation since Shakespeare's time, here with us tonight. There'd be 17 people alongside. Now, the funny thing is, each of them could have a masterpiece of Shakespeare's in their hand. Perhaps a parent with Hamlet, a, a grandparent with A Midsummer Night's Dream, a great-grandparent with the sonnets, Macbeth, King Lear of the Tempest, all the way back. Now, for my students, a semester seems like forever, but 400 years is a, a long reading list, so it might be a good time for us to ask why we do it, why we have done it, why we should do it. Why do we read Shakespeare? Well, you could say he's the best writer we've ever had in our language. His words, characters that seem so real, we feel like we know them and always have, imagery and ideas like never before or since. Sometimes it feels like our very idea of culture revolves around his achievement. All this may seem self-evident, but it's not evident to everyone. In fact, a growing chorus of critics of the educational system says that we read Shakespeare too much, we teach him too much, spend too much energy and, and, and time writing and, and teaching and, and reading him. By and large, these are proponents of the STEM fields, uh, proponents of a certain commercialization of the STEM fields. I should be very, very clear. We couldn't have our, our modern lives without science. I'm a fan of science. Um, but those who see a, a pot of gold at the end of the STEM rainbow often ask why we do anything if there isn't an immediate commercial advantage at the end. Now, it's a pointed question and Shakespeare's not the only writer it's been pointed at. In fact, we could take him as a metaphor for fields like the humanities generally, the, the fine arts, right, for disciplines and activities like, like painting and, and music, dance, history, the classics, foreign languages and cultures, all of which have, have, have found themselves under attack, having to justify their very existence and fight for funding. We could take this question at its face value and ask, well, what is there possibly to learn about Shakespeare after 400 years? Why, why should we spend our time and money researching him, teaching him the way we do? It's a good question. But truth be told, the 17 generations of readers between us and Shakespeare have barely scratched the surface of all the mysteries there are about William Shakespeare. Born in Stratford, he made his way to London where he became famous, rich, returned to Stratford and died. It's the in-between that we're not quite certain about. In fact, one of the, the biggest mysteries about William Shakespeare was when he published and wrote the individual works that he did. Did this work come before that work or that work before that one? Did he read another author first or that author him? Did he start a trend or finish it? Now, you might ask what it could possibly matter um, to, to find out more about chronology. Why is that important? Ask an astronomer, a historian, an evolutionary biologist, and they will all tell you that chronology is the very basis of our knowledge for anything, finding out when things happened and in what order. How could we do it, though? Barring the discovery of a, a, a new document in an attic or an archive, unlikely, but possible. Less likely still building a time machine to go back and watch Shakespeare at work. How could we hope to do it? Now, this is precisely the question that a fellow researcher and I set out to answer. My collaborator in this research project is Dr. Genevieve Smith, a PhD in integrative biology, a STEM field, 
I'll point out, and an expert in statistics, uh, another STEM field. Um, and together, we wound up building a, a time machine out of Shakespeare's works themselves, that is, assembling his works, looking at their stylistic changes over time in order to parse out their development in temporal location. Okay. To get some idea of how Shakespeare's language works, I'm, I'm going to need your help. Okay? But like everybody, wherever you are, right, to take your hands, if you can, and make two fists like this and squeeze them a little tight. Now lift them up, lift them up. This is Shakespeare's verse. Do you feel how tight that is? Now relax your fingers and let your hands drop. Now that's his prose. Now the alternation between tension and relaxation is between verse and prose in his works. He was a master of language, of course, but he was also quite bilingual, we might say, in his plays. And it's this alteration of verse and prose that's responsible for some of his greatest effects. Now, something interesting to know about his verse is when he started his career, that ten-syllable line that you all know from school, bum 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 that, that regular 10-beat line, okay, um, changed over the course of his career. And the longer he wrote, the more like prose it became, so that by the time we get to his later plays, his lines become longer, the thoughts stretch over. Let me give you an example of how it sounds. Um, here's a, a line from the very beginning of his career a play called The Taming of the Shrew. This is the Lord in the beginning of the play in the induction. He stumbles across a drunken Christopher Sly on the ground and says, Oh, monstrous beast, how like a swine he lies. About nine years later, in Hamlet, to be or not to be, that is the question. A longer passage still, right? This is Cleopatra and Antony and Cleopatra, maybe nine years later. I'm praising her lover, Mark Antony, the Roman general. I want you to listen to see if you can hear how his thoughts can no longer be confined in a ten-syllable line. And Cleopatra's speech goes something like this. His legs bestrid the ocean. His reared arm crested the world. His voice was property to all the tuned spheres, and that to friends. But when he meant to quail and shake the orb, he was as rattling thunder. For his bounty, there was no winter in it. In autumn it was, that grew the more by reaping. His delights were dolphin-like, and showed his back among the element they lived in. In his livery walked crowns and crownets. Realms and islands were as plates dropped from his pocket. Now, with apologies to Cleopatra, I think what you heard there was, was the, the, the kind of overflowing of ideas. It's no longer a, 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 a quick, steady, ten-beat line. Listen to the first parts of each of those lines again. O monstrous beast, four syllables. To be or not to be, six syllables. His legs bestrid the ocean, seven syllables. Notice we're getting progressively further into the blank verse line before we take that kind of pause that's natural to the, the English verse line. Okay. What Jean Viev and I did was measure these pauses across all of Shakespeare's verse, right? put it through a very sophisticated statistical analysis that we borrowed from archaeologists where they use something called correspondence analysis to search for patterns and patterns of patterns in data. We ran the data a thousand times in a bootstrapping procedure to give ourselves more valid parameters for understanding where Shakespeare's plays might be located on a continuum. And the results were remarkable. In fact, in, in some cases where we've got very good external evidence that a play probably happened at a certain day, I'm sorry, a certain month or year, um, the test put that play in precisely that place. The Comedy of Airs, for instance, Twelfth Night, Henry VIII. But in still other cases where we don't have very good evidence at all, but merely tradition for when a play was written, it changed our ideas about where that play fell. As you like it, Othello, Troilus and Cressida, all of the late plays as a group seem to have been worked on, 
perhaps toward their publication in something that would eventually become the first folio after Shakespeare's death. So this research project changes our idea about Shakespeare's lifetimes and works. Is it commercializable? That's not for us to say alone. For like all research, it means to add to a conversation, to add to our store of knowledge. Perhaps it could tell us something about dating documents, a, a will, for instance, a diplomatic cable. Perhaps it could tell us something about the relationship between aging and creativity, between the head and the hand, between the brain and the pen. All of these things may come up as a result of the research. Again, it's a contribution to further knowledge. Let me tell you a story in closing that's familiar to you. In shape, uh, four young men decide to drop out of college in the STEM fields to become rich so that they can retire before the age of 30. Whether it's through creating an app or some other kind of technology or a company, right? they have their sights on ruling the world. Now, the funny thing is, what they want to do with the untold millions that they're going to earn, buy an enormous house, architecturally fantastic and beautiful. Fine art on every wall, room to room music, leather bound books stretching from floor to ceiling, tickets to the theater and the opera, foreign travel, learning a foreign language. Now, ironically, all of these things come from the humanities, from the arts. They're all about the product of civilization itself. Now, Shakespeare knew this story 400 years ago, for he tells it to us in Love's Labor's Lost, a wonderful and complicated early comedy in which four young men retire from the world in order to conquer it, a life of study and fasting, more study, no contact at all with women, except four young women visit the court and their world changes from underneath their feet. News of a death intrudes upon all the happiness and merriment, and the play ends on a very somber note. Because Shakespeare knew something about life that we forget when we think we can plan everything and separate ourselves from the fullness of human life itself. He knew how rich and diverse experience is and must be. Now, Shakespeare is at the center of one definition of our culture. For this very reason, not only the beauty of his language, but what he knows about everything that makes up human beings. If we're lucky enough to have 17 more generations of readers, each of them, including yourself, could have a separate work of Shakespeare's in their hand. May it be so. Thank you. I'm an art historian. I'm also a first-generation college graduate and a first-generation graduate degree-having person. I'm not supposed to have an art history degree. I'm supposed to be a lawyer or a medical doctor. So how did I become a professional art historian? That's a good question. So I had the good fortune of attending a private school in LA, and my senior year, I was required to go to five museums. One of those museums was the J. Paul Getty Museum, which is a beautiful place overlooking the Pacific Ocean right on the cliff. And it was there that I discovered Greek and Roman art. And I thought, this is amazing. How can I keep doing this? I went to college, had a large state school, not unlike this one. And there, I discovered Introduction to Humanities. I read Homer, Gilgamesh, other great um, works of Western art. And it was then that I discovered that I really wanted to make a life in the arts and in the humanities. How could I do that? I didn't know yet. 
So I went on to work in museums. I got a graduate degree and then a second graduate degree. And during that time, what I learned was that museums were desperately interested in having diversity. Now, they didn't quite know how to do that. They wanted diverse audiences, and they knew those diverse audiences needed to have art that reflected them and their culture. And so that time in, in museums and knowing that I needed to participate in that in some way made me do a couple of things. I decided that I wanted to make art and museums accessible to people of color, people who are not traditionally given museums. That means people who are also not wealthy. And so how, how could I do that? I decided to become a professor. And there are a couple of things that I do as a professor. One is to give students the real feeling and knowledge that they own art and that they own museums too, that they belong there. I teach them to have visual literacy and critical thinking skills that they can take out into the world to think critically about advertisements, to think critically about art and all of the images that they are overwhelmed by. And what I do, I will say, is a part of social justice. It's not some extra. It's not just something that I do because I love it only. I do it because it makes a difference. And so I'd like to tell you a little bit about the research that I'm doing right now because the research relates directly to this idea of thinking about how to give art to different kinds of people. So my current research focuses on artists who are looking at and taking or appropriating art from a different era. So I'm interested in appropriation, I'm interested in trauma, that is how artists are thinking about difficult psychological and physical experiences and about conceptual art. So this evening what I'd like to talk with you about is one particular work, and that's a work by the artist Michael Ray Charles. And if you were kind enough to have picked up a program, you will have an image of that painting there that you can look at. So Michael Ray Charles is a painter and a professor at the University of Houston. He made this painting that you're looking at right now in 1992. And what you see is that it's a male figure. He is standing in profile. He is wearing a top hat and tails. In the lower part of his body, he is wearing a kind of chicken costume. He also wears a white mask and white gloves. So perceptive viewers that you are, you will see that he has this top hat, kind of looks like something you might have seen before. He's got the stars and stripes, red and white, some blue. It's not very bright and colorful. It's a little kind of dark and weathered. And he's got these gloves and this mask. And those are particular. He's doing that for a reason. He is taking iconic images that relate to minstrelsy and all of the stories and narratives that go along with them. And he's putting them in a different context and doing something new with them. He's revising. He's innovating with those images, with those stories. And so you probably recognize the top hat and the tails as belonging to Uncle Sam. And you would be right. He was looking at early 20th century posters and announcements that are uh, designed to recruit service people for the military service. And if you think about images of Uncle Sam, one of which is reproduced for you, they generally show a white-haired and white-bearded man with a top hat and with a tuxedo or uh, tails jacket on. And usually he's a very active person, very active figure in the frame. He's reaching out at the viewer. He is soliciting something from the viewer, trying to get you to feel patriotic and for you to want to join the war efforts. Now, if you look back to the 
Image Sam by Michael Ray Charles, he has a very different posture. His posture is more retiring. His posture is less cocky. It is less assured than this image of Uncle Sam. And so he's taken pieces of this Uncle Sam image and he's turned them. He's made them something different. He's made them a kind of commentary on American culture and patriotism rather than a true uh, kind of showing of patriotism. Now there's a second image that he is directly borrowing from and that is this image of Burt Williams. Burt Williams, you might know, was an African-American artist, actor of Caribbean descent, who was um, very famous in the late 19th and early 20th century. He was an acclaimed actor who, because of the time period in which he worked, was forced to dress up as a minstrel and to wear blackface on his already brown skin. And so the image that you see is a portrait of Williams in costume. And the costume that he in turn is borrowing from is a costume from a character that we know to be Zip Coon. And he is a stock character that appeared in minstrel shows that were made by white minstrel actors from the mid 19th century. So again, we have a couple of cultural borrowings that are happening at the same time. So what Burt Williams is doing is having to perform the stereotype that was created about 50 years before, and that's really the only choice that he has. He was a gifted actor, and he wanted to do what he was good at, and at that moment, that was what it took. So, Here's Michael Ray Charles looking to Burt Williams, who was before that looking to earlier minstrel actors. And it is a kind of commentary on the fact that African Americans are oftentimes forced to put on a certain kind of mask. So here we have the author, I'm sorry, the artist looking at the actor who's looking at another set of actors and all of these stories go together. Michael Ray Charles is also thinking very critically about the tradition of appropriation that happens in the field of art history. And if you think about a figure like Jasper Johns, who for the last 40 years has used flags, for example, to um, exercise his um, expressiveness in his medium, which is paint, if you think about Andy Warhol, who made big Brillo boxes, if you think about Betty Saar, who has taken the figure of Aunt Jemima and armed her with a rifle in defense rather than in servitude, these are long traditions of appropriation that have happened within art history. And so he is also inserting himself into this art historical tradition and commenting on African-American culture at the same time. So if I could draw your attention back to Sam, I'd like for you to just consider what the painting looks like, not just the icons, not just the images that appear inside it. Just above the tail, there is a kind of um, very expressive moment in the yellow paint. Beneath it, there is a kind of washed out and dragged area of red paint. Those are the artist expressing his feelings or what he imagines the feelings of that figure may be. He is using these dark brown muddy colors to talk about nostalgia, to think about how old things oftentimes refer to old things and they both have the same meanings and different meanings attached to them at the same time. And so there's something about nostalgia, there's something about mustiness, there's something about antique quality that Michael Ray Charles is evoking in this painting that was just made about 20 years ago, not very long ago. And so when he's thinking about nostalgia, he's not 
necessarily thinking about it in good ways. He's thinking about how troubled it can be for African Americans, how, trouble, how troubling it can be for American culture altogether. So this is really important work that he is doing. And he is certainly not the only artist to do it. There are others that I am working on in my current project. But the really important thing is that they are thinking about these emotional residues or um, resonances that stick with images and that they are expressing and exploring in their art. And of course, they're doing it by looking at older images. So there are images such as these, which deal with minstrelsy. Other artists are looking at images from slavery from the 19th century. Other artists are looking to um, historic moments from the civil rights movement, rethinking them and tweaking them. So you might ask, what does this have to do with humanities? Well, it has everything to do with humanities. It is a thinking about what our identities are as individuals, thinking about what our individuals are, our identities are as Americans. It's vital work. Thank you.